this is day two of our Cow's DPFL online workshop for integrative modeling of brain energy metabolism. Um, I hope you enjoyed yesterday and are ready for the next day. So we have a, um, a nice lineup. Um, I'll come to that in a second. Uh, let me first again um, mention that this workshop um, has been made possible as part of the uh, many year collaboration between Cow's and EPFL um, on this very topic. So um, uh, yesterday we had uh, international invited guest speakers and today we'll share with you in more detail um, uh, results from, from this collaboration uh, between CAUS and, and EPFL. Um, my name is Felix Schumann, I'm from EPFL. Um, I'll get this uh, second day kicked off and I want to mention again that uh, the workshop will be recorded. Um, and typically for uh, us sticking to the time um, and agenda, I would ask you that you hold your questions until the end of the individual talks. Now, so the second day, as I, as I mentioned, um, is in a way um, sort of split in two parts, which is um, uh, one part will be sharing some highlights of the tools and, and methods and workflows uh, that we've developed and applied in this collaboration between CALS and DPFL. And then the second session uh, will be about the, the models um, that we've been able to, to reconstruct and, and, and simulate from that. So um, that's the plan for the afternoon. And I'll get us um, kicked off uh, in, uh, to, this, to the second day. So I want to start with that something which is <laughs> close to my heart is that the um, how modern day electronic programmable computers have really um, changed or and augmented the way we do science. And in a way, this is a, a story that is, has now 70 years of, of history, really with the onset of modern computers, electronic programmable computers uh, around the end of the Second World War. And with every decade and these computers becoming more powerful, um, different disciplines in science and engineering were able to jump on that train and use those um, tools for, uh, for their science. And in the beginning, these were simple models, uh, for mechanical models. At some point, we could do a weather forecast. At some point, we could test um, nuclear weapons without having to explode them. And um, essentially, every discipline in, in science and engineering has jumped on it. And uh, sort of at the EPFL, at Blue Brain Project, we really thought that neuroscience would have to benefit from this development um, as well. So that give, gave birth to the Blue Brain project that Henry Markram started in 2005 at EPFL. And it is really a method, if you wish. It's not so much about simulating the brain. It's a methodology that uh, takes data from the neuroscience community that is then systematically extracting parameters for models, taking these models and simulation experiments take the predictions of these models uh, and validate them against the experiment and use this to learn something about experiments and really use this methodology to do better experiments, have better understanding of the data and um, have insights which with experiments alone you couldn't be otherwise able to, to gain. And um, this is a journey, so it's not a, something that... Um, Pierre, can I mute you? Sorry. Um, so th this uh, took us a couple of years to, to automate this process and to make this process tractable because you're not just building a model and then tuning the parameters uh, for years to come, but you would like to crank this dial and regenerate your model every time you have new um, experimental data coming in. So there's an entire set of workflows and tools that take you from the uh, experimental data to extracting these parameters, then having a model which you take uh, to the human uh, in the loop and the scientists in the loop and do something with, with the model, right? You then actually, after you build the model and then the science of building, having structural insights and insights about the data, uh, you can then switch it on and uh, see what, uh, how it behaves in experiments. And in a way, this is really similar or analogous to what uh, you do when you do a weather forecast, you have to build a model of the world and then you run different predictions uh, for the different um, measurements you, you take. 
And in our case, this uh, has been uh, the reconstruction of a cubic millimeter of um, somatosensory cortex of the, of the rat, which we can then use to study in different, um, um, different uh, simu uh, simulation protocols and uh, see how these brain piece of brain tissue behaves in the computer. And um, this paper we published in 2015 really is um, presented this novel approach to build systematically from data this um, uh, detailed biophysical model. Even though we don't have all the data, we had to then predict certain parameters and um, we could then explain different uh, observed activation states that previously has been seen in an experiment. And we could show that really um, these, these states and uh, emerge from, from the tissue of how it was reconstructed. And you can then use it to study all sorts of, of phenomena um, thereafter. So we have um, since used this model of cubic millimeter of, of red brain to study all sorts of um, phenomena in silico, whether it is about the structure to function, whether it is um, what's the role of, of, of noise and how is it possible that cortex computes reliably. Uh, we have um, studied auditory surprise responses. Um, we have uh, looked at voltage sensitive dye imaging, always using this detailed model and having a new multi-scale insight as to sort of how these brain signals that previously have been measured come about by being able to, in the model, link them down to the biophysics of the individual ion channels and cells. We have furthermore um, followed this approach to not only stop at the cubic millimeter of of red brain, but applied it to larger portions um, of the somatosensory cortex, um, different brain regions, the thalamus, the hippocampus, CA1, and even the entire neocortex. So this methodology we've been starting in, in Blueburn really, I think, has, has started in, uh, um, an entire um, journey into do, building these biophysically detailed models of brain and using them for uh, gaining insight and complementing experiment and, and theory. And to the context of our uh, collaboration between KAUST and, and EPFL, it really goes back now, um, we said it started in 2013, where we thought that um, what we had started to develop at the site of EPFL, the Blueberry Project, uh, this approach to in silico studies, reconstruction simulation of brain tissue, that it shouldn't really stop at the level of cells, but it should um, address other parts of the brain tissue, and that is the glial cells and the vasculature. And um, together, um, Henry and, and uh, Marco and Pierre Magistretti really said that we should um, extend this type of modeling to the um, level of detail of, of glial cells. And that really um, gave birth to this collaboration between um, Pia Magistretti at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology and Henry Markram uh, at the EPFL. And uh, with the goal to really have a, a computer-based reconstruction simulation of a neuroglioavasculature unit. And thanks to the um, generous funding of, of both um, organizations really, but also mainly COWS, um, we had several uh, iterations of, of um, financial support um, for this collaborative work. And today we are going to um, uh, show results of that. Um, but just to mention, it started with a strategic alliance and then had two competitive research grants uh, from KAUST um, that, that uh, supported this work. Now, um, this is a preview of how now this uh, cubic millimeter of brain tissue uh, of neurons um, looks if you actually add the glial cells and the vasculature, and you will hear more about that um, in the coming um, uh, remaining talks of the, of the workshop. Um, and here I just want to mention that sort of how this collaboration was mostly structured. I had already um, uh, alluded to the fact that the two main PIs were Pierre Magistretti and Henry Markram, furthermore, Marcus Hadwiger and myself, we contributed certain parts of this uh, collaboration, which really started from um, a model, data modality and experiments that have the resolution to, to identify uh, glial cells, the segmentation of that data from data to computational 
uh, structures, reconstructing structures, then modeling and equipping these structures with equations that would uh, reflect the activity of that, and then taking this, uh, these models and simulating them and comparing the, the simulated model with the experimental data that we have, requiring uh, additional um, uh, resources like uh, visualization, high performance computing. So this uh, is how the collaboration um, has been structured. And it really, if you wish, is taking us from the electron microscopy data um, to the tracking, having structural uh, 3D models in the computer, simulating them on um, powerful supercomputers, and then running in silico um, uh, experimentation and comparing the results um, uh, with experiment or having predictions that uh, others will have to validate in future experiments. So today we'll hear from those who actually really did the work. So I'm very excited about these two sessions that are coming. Um, we will have um, the, the chairs introducing the individual speakers. But anyways, as I had mentioned before, so we'll um, show highlights about the, the tools and workflows that came out of this collaboration, and then highlights about the modeling um, outcomes. Um, with that, uh, I would like to hand over to Dan, who will take us to the uh, next um, session. Thank you very much. Great. Um, thank you, Felix. I'll go ahead and uh, start off the first session of the day. My name is Dan Keller. I'm uh, from the EPFL. And um, let's see, I will be sharing this second session. The first session speakers will be Karada Kali, Marco Agus, and um, Marwan Abdella. Now, the first speaker is Karado Kali. He did his uh, undergraduate work in electrical engineering at the Polytechnical uh, University of Turin. He then came to the EPFL, where he did a master's in neuroscience, and then to the UNIL, University um, of Lausanne, where he did a PhD uh, under, in the lab of Paola Bezzi. Now, um, even at the time, he was working with uh, astrocytes um, with gliotransmission. He next did a year-long postdoc in the laboratory of Graham Knott, where he worked on electron microscopy. And this set the stage for his next postdoc at KAUST, where much of the work that you'll hear about today was done. Um, he is currently a professor um, at the uh, um, University of Turin um, of hum Human Anatomy. So, uh, so without any further ado, uh, I'll let you take it away, Corrado. Thanks a lot, Dan, for the kind introduction. And I'll start sharing my screen, which should be fine. All right, so you should be able to see it. Um, <clears throat> again, thanks a lot for the very kind introduction, Dan. Um, so today I'll be, um, I'll be talking about most of the work or at least highlights of, uh, of the work that I uh, have performed during uh, the seven years I spent uh, in KAUST as a postdoc in uh, the lab of uh, Pier Magistretti. Uh, as Dan said, I've been, uh, and as also Felix mentioned, I've been working a lot on electron microscopy and the uh, 3D reconstruction and 3D models of astrocytes. In um, <clears throat> the last 20 years, there's been a number of, uh, a number of papers, a number of works that uh, has been uh, focusing on 3D reconstruction of astrocytes, not as much as, uh, as in neurons. Uh, and as you can see, most of these works from this very small list has been focusing on um, mostly on whatever is revolving around the synapse and uh, therefore trying to, uh, trying to look ultrastructurally about the contribution of the astrocytes spatially to uh, the synapse. But actually 3DM uh, is, uh, is much older. And if, you, uh, and if you look back before 1990, basically, uh, I was able to drag uh, a number of uh, papers where really people didn't really focus on the synapse and they were much more interested on the astrocyte per se. And I, I actually love this picture. This is, 
this is not a micrograph and this is not a digital uh, uh, a digital image this is a photograph from a uh, from a model that has been done by hand from uh, uh, from a manual uh, stack from a uh, transmission electromicroscopy uh, handmade from uh, from wolf a, a beautiful model so this is somehow the uh, a precursor of uh, of 3d printing so uh Mm, with this said, why why is this a good model? Why this is a good moment to use 3D EM uh, on astrocytes? Well, in the last 15 years, uh, electron microscopy technology has been evolving a lot, uh, in particular uh, thanks to connectomics. And uh, <clears throat> so this is a video that shows how uh, the, the, the process works. This is a 3D microscope, which is a machine that uh, we have been uh, using extensively in cows. Uh, it's a scanning electron microscope, which has a chamber inside of it that contains uh, a diamond knife, so a microtome embedding in the system. So this microtome is uh, capable of cutting automatically the serial sections, and then an electron beam of a scanning electron microscope is able to image via backscattered, uh, backscattered electrons images from the surface, hence the name uh, surface uh, uh, block phase electron microscopy. And in the end, you're able to get automatically a volume of tissue from where you can do uh, segmentation in a manual or semi-automatic way. Uh, this is uh, in this picture here, you can see a reconstruction uh, from uh, from the neuropil that highlights the presence of the dendrite and uh, and the axon making synapse. So what we did was to adopt this strategy and to adopt this technique uh, to to reconstruct uh, astrocytes from uh, from a block of tissue. And uh, this is a this is the last paper uh, that we published that came out in Progress in Neurobiology in 2019 where we have reconstructed uh, a block of, uh, of a P14 rat somatosensory cortex uh, that has been imaged in cows that has been prepared uh, in the, back in Switzerland uh, in, the, in the lab of Graham Not, who I thank for uh, always the, the, the technical support that, uh, that gave us throughout the years. Uh, the, 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 the most difficult thing was really to to identify uh, these cells, uh, because um, I'm I'm very much skilled in identifying different types of cells and different types of structures within the neuropil. But when it comes to the whole parenchyma, and you have entire cells. I realized immediately that the task was much harder because I wasn't really used to to distinguish different types of cells uh, and how do they look like under EM and if for neurons, the task for, was relatively easy because the neurons are bigger, um, their nuclei, it's easily identifiable also from its size and shape. But the other type of cells, this was uh, not as straightforward. So we had to come out uh, with a strategy to identify cells, and in particular for astrocytes, because this block contains a large vessel, which came in handy for our analysis of uh, the NGV. We started from the blood vessel we identify the perivascular processes of the astrocytes, which are easy to identify, and then we track them back to, to identify all the astrocytes. So long story short, for the benefit of time, we, we managed to reconstruct a number of cells from this block. This is a sparse reconstruction, so we, we took just some of the cells, 16 in total, four per type. We have, this, we have reconstructed four pericytes, cells that are at the interface with the blood vessels. These are microglial cells in yellow, uh, in gray, we have neurons, and in green, we have the astrocytes. You can see how their whole structure is really occluding uh, the view. And this is, uh, this is striking. And you will observe this uh, when uh, this video will, will allow you to really dig in uh, these, uh, this reconstruction. Uh, this is striking because indeed the, the, the volume of individual cells on average uh, talking about astrocytes, is smaller compared uh, to neurons, but the surface area of these cells is indeed much, much larger. And this is uh, this is a measure of how much these cells 
uh, spends efforts, let's say, at least from an infrastructure point of view, uh, to, to interact with their neighborhoods. And you will see this uh, right now when this video will, will show you the, the, the entire structure of the cells. You can immediately see how astrocytes are smaller uh, compared to neurons. So this gave us uh, a hint for, uh, for the following analysis that uh, we were able to perform on these, uh, on these cells. And the first thing that we did, because indeed this, this block didn't contain entire cells, most of it, um, we, we have calculated the surface area to volume ratio. Uh, and you can immediately see how uh, uh, this value uh, SVR from astrocytes is uh, much larger compared to, uh, to the other cells. And also similar to pericytes, which are very flat and very small. So this is an example of the kind of analysis that we were able to, to perform uh, on, on these cells. Uh, we, we performed a set of analysis to, to describe uh, uh, numerically, let's say, uh, to, give, um, to give some statistics uh, about these cells. So I won't go in detail on this. Um, and this is to give you an idea on how much it took to do the reconstructions. Uh, because most of this work uh, was uh, done, uh, especially thanks to Kalpana Kare, a technician in, uh, in my lab back in Kaust, who was doing this work by hand and was training students uh, to do this, to speed up time. But still, it was taking a uh, significant amount of time to, to, to segment these, uh, these cells uh, uh, manually. Uh, the time went down when, at a certain point, we managed to come out uh, with a, with a semi-automated way to, to reconstruct these cells uh, using, uh, uh, using other tools, in particular TRAC-EM, uh, together uh, with an adaptive version that we had in the lab of Elastic, which is a semi-automated tool developed uh, in Germany. Uh, we are right, right now in the position where uh, we are starting to work with a uh, automated system and uh, based on AI to do the to do the segmentation. This is a proof of concept thanks to uh, collaboration with the lab of uh, Hans Peter uh, Fister. Uh, you you have heard yesterday a talk by inspiring talk by by Johanna. So in her lab uh, they're collaborating uh, uh, with uh, uh, with Jeff Lickman and uh, they are they are developing these tools. So they helped us to to start doing a full. Uh, automated segmentation. So this has been done uh, solely by um, uh, by the help uh, of, a, of a computer uh, with AI. Um, in the lab uh, back in Kaust, uh, we thanks to Fernando, Daniela, and uh, Julian, uh, three uh, three students that uh, recently joined right right before I left, but still uh, working under my supervision. And also thanks. Dan, another uh, very talented technician who has been supervising uh, their, their job. She's a computer scientist. Uh, they recently managed to, to get a work, uh, a tool developed by Google, uh, the flood filling uh, network to get this segmentation done and uh, in an automated way, uh, dense segmentation. And this is something that uh, we, have, we have been working on uh, since then and we most certainly will set up in a more uh, systematic way in the, in the near future. So the goal of all of this, and this is something that uh, Felix has mentioned uh, already, is somehow to complete this, uh, this picture. So this is a, this is a famous um, uh, cubic millimeter simulation of, um, of, a, of a rat cortical column. And uh, as all of you know, uh, this picture is beautiful, but it's missing half of it. It's missing uh, the NGV, it's missing glia. Uh, is missing astrocytes and is missing uh, the vasculature. So together with our colleagues at Blue Brain Project, and you will hear more of this uh, in, uh, in the later talks, we developed uh, a strategy that is allowing to take, um, uh, to take this morphology, to digitize them, uh, to convert um, all these data into statistics that can be used to populate a cortical column with digital glia, with digital astrocytes that uh, uh, can be then uh, uh, revitalized. Let me let me say in a non uh, very appropriate term, probably um, to uh, to simulate their metabolic coupling uh, with neurons. 
Um, <clears throat> one tool that we have developed recently, always uh, with uh, with Dania Bodges, uh, is uh, uh, an automated uh, skeletonizer uh, that uh, that has been enhanced with the use of um, of virtual reality, which is something that uh, we have been uh, very much interested in uh, Kaust because Kaust has really pioneered this technique since uh, it came out in early um, uh, at the beginning of uh, uh, of the last uh, of last decade. They were already investing in in VR, so we have uh, we have taken uh, um, uh, we we have used the facilities. Uh, that were uh, available at Kaust, and we have developed a number of tools, and in particular, Dania became very skilled. And this is uh, the latest tool that she that she developed that has been also proofread by some of the colleagues here at the University of Turin because we're really interested and also uh, very expert in uh, in morphologists. As Dan said, I'm a professor in human anatomy, so we have a, a tradition in uh, in morphology and neuromorphology. So this tool. <laughs> Uh, is uh, is actually um, uh, under um, under testing uh, uh, with uh, uh, within the lab and within the department by uh, by a number of colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> but I would still like to show uh, to show you the the, the first uh, the first uh, the first work that we have published together with uh, with Pierre Magistret in the journal of Comparative Neurology, and this was really when we pioneered the use of uh, virtual reality. So we we had at our um, at our disposition um, um, uh, a stack uh, that has been uh, again acquired uh, by by Graham Not at the PFL that he kindly shared with us. From uh, at very high resolution from the neuropil of an adult rat. Uh, so thanks to the to the excellent resolution, uh, the automatic segmentation uh, was uh, uh, was possible in a very efficient way uh, and in a very easy way. And um, and in particular because we're interested in um, um, in the metabolism, we have reconstructed. I have. Constructed other glycogen granules, and we have studied the distribution of these glycogen granules within this uh, this astrocyte, the interface with all the synapses, uh, and then using virtual reality. This is a video of Cave that you have seen already yesterday, but we we, we like to show because this is really impressive. Uh, we could uh, we could perform uh, um, we could perform uh, analysis of various type, uh, qualitative and quantitative analysis. And from this work, uh, we, uh, we we managed to to understand somehow that um, the, the glycogen granules has a, a certain tendency of being, uh, uh, let's say, of facing synapses, so they're not randomly distributed, and uh, and in particular, they they like uh, they like more to stay uh, to to face axons uh, axons and boutons. Um, we have extended this work on another set of data, uh, so we, we we have ampled the the reconstructions from this data set that, uh, from a work uh, uh, with Graham Knott back when I was a postdoc in his lab, published in 2018, um, <clears throat> and then from these blocks of neuropils, these were six uh, six blocks uh, of four months and 24 months old. We have reconstructed it again all the astrocytes and all the glycogen granules and have studied the distribution of the glycogen granules within, uh, within these blocks. Um, and the last thing that we did, thanks to uh, Maria Fernanda Veloz, uh, former uh, master student and now PhD student, uh, Nico Tutel with me and with, uh, and with Pierre, she had studied thanks to um, uh, a visualization paradigm that we have developed with uh, Marco Agus uh, using Connectome Explorer, uh, the distribution of these glycogen granules uh, using a, a tool called GLAM that I, I don't have the time to describe in detail, but probably Marco will talk, uh, will talk to you uh, about this uh, more in detail. Uh, with this, I uh, sorry, I don't know what's happening to my. Okay, uh, I I conclude by thanking my former lab in Kaust. It was an inspiring and uh, fantastic uh, uh, journey. Uh, thanks to Pierre and uh, to my lab uh, back in Kaust. You have seen uh, Marifer, who's still working uh, together with me, and a particular thanks to Dania and to Kalpana, my 
uh, uh, the, 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 the partners of my journey because they've been working with me uh, until now. And thanks to my, to my new lab here in Turin that uh, has been uh, so warmingly welcome me uh, here in Turin. And uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. Great. Um, well, we have time for a couple of questions for Corrado. Does anyone have any questions? So maybe I'll start. Um, what do you think are the technical limitations to, um, to how big of an area that can be um, visualized or collected with this 3D EM uh, technique? So um, from, a, uh, from a microscopy point of view, uh, most certainly the, the limitation it's uh, coming with the penetration of, uh, the, of the compounds uh, that, uh, that, that makes uh, the, um, uh, the tissue um, uh, visible, uh, let's say, uh, by, uh, by electron microscopy. So, you, you need to, to, treat, uh, to treat the tissue in order to be electron dense and to be imaged with the, um, um, to, be, um, to be visualized by, by electron microscopy. And uh, these compounds have a, uh, have a certain capacity of penetrating, uh, uh, of penetrating the tissue just like antibodies. So uh, it's a little, uh, yeah, it's a little bit like antibodies. So if you go beyond a certain, a certain limit, then uh, the, uh, the, 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 the density of, uh, of these compounds will not be enough and then you will not be able to, to see them uh, clearly anymore. But to overcome this problem, there have been uh, some protocols that, be, that have been uh, developed, like the BROPA protocol, uh, that needs many, many, uh, that needs several, several months. Uh, but with these protocols, you can actually make an entire brain uh, electron dense. It's a bit tricky, but it's, uh, but it's possible. The other problem comes from, uh, of course, uh, the, from the data handling point of view, because uh, you can, uh, if, uh, if the acquisition works fine, you would uh, very easily acquire gigabytes or terabytes of data within, uh, uh, within a few weeks uh, of working. So at that point, you will need uh, a, very, uh, a very tough uh, um, hardware uh, and software power to, to handle uh, this amount of data that then needs still to be processed for uh, whatever you want to do, whether uh, it is only uh, visualization or whether it's also uh, processing segmentation of whatsoever. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Um, I think I have a question. Uh, um, Corrado, wonderful stuff. Uh, Look, looking at your beautiful data, one, one dreams of uh, staining your favorite protein and, and see wh where it is, right? So uh -huh. what is the, the, the current state of the immunohistochemistry and the combination with your, with, with your techniques? Is, is that still too early or is it, is it working? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, with immunohistochemistry, the problem is always penetration, right? So. Um antibody penetration and in particular the problem with electron microscopy is that uh, when you permeabilize uh, the tissue if you're if you're working on uh, on light microscopy you would not necessarily notice uh, a detriment of uh, of the tissue but with electron microscopy if you if you go too far with it because you want to have your antibody penetrating too much then uh, of course uh, the surface uh, and the membranes of your tissue Will, um, um, let's say the morphology will be uh, much more degraded. So technically it's possible, then depending on your uh, antibody or the protein you want to image, you, you have to find a compromise. Uh, and this is true uh, for electron microscopy in general between the quality of the tissue and then the penetration of the antibody. Because I mean, the, the reason why you use electron microscopy is that you want to see at the highest pos possible resolution. So you're always interested that that level in morphology to a certain extent, but, but it's possible and it's doable. All right, I think um, we should move to our next speaker. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Corrado. 
Our next speaker is uh, Marco Agus. He is currently at the Hamid bin Khalifa University in, in Qatar. But before that, he was the, the, um, the Kaust um, University, where much of the work you'll hear about today was done. And even before that, he was a research scientist at the Center for Research, Development, and Advanced Studies in Sardinia. Um, he has a master's in electrical engineering and a PhD in mechanical design. Um, so we're very interested in hearing about what you have to say uh, today on the subject, um, I guess, of visualization. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. I hope you can hear me. I can uh, share my screen now. Let me see if you see, let me know if you see the screen correctly. Looks good. Okay, I can start the presentation. Oh, okay. So uh, thanks, uh, Dan, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm uh, Marco Agus, uh, and I'm currently at Hamad bin Khalifa University in Doha. And uh, today I will talk uh, about the backstage of uh, some of the activities that were uh, amazingly uh, uh, told by Corrado in his talk. And uh, I will talk about how visual computing technologies can be applied to support a neuroscience investigation, especially for what concerns electron microscopy based investigations. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, for the invitation, uh, uh, the KAUST and the BBP for inviting me uh, to this event that uh, recently was made possible since the political situation. And especially I would like to thank uh, Professor Pierre Magistretti and Professor Marcus Adwiger and also Professor Felix Schulman for uh, the support uh, along uh, this uh, five year long uh, successful collaboration. And uh, in this case, I will uh, tell you about uh, uh, a really long and uh, a really successful example of a multidisciplinary effort in which uh, we were able uh, to, uh, uh, to join the forces uh, between the different communities, the visualization community and, uh, and the neuroscience community. And uh, it was an amazing experience for me, in, uh, especially for the mutual support that I received uh, from uh, all the collaborators. Uh, and uh, it was a really symbiotic experience because uh, I had the chance uh, to uh, work a very long time uh, with uh, Corrado because we were also sharing an apartment and uh, we uh, experienced many, many events together. And uh, we were even uh, uh, doing uh, jokes about that because uh, when Corrado was attending uh, some uh, visual computing event, uh, I always introduced him as my personal domain scientist. And on the opposite way, when uh, Corrado was uh, uh, introducing me in uh, the community, he was uh, always uh, referring to me as his personal visualization scientist. And uh, another, another point uh, that I really want to mention is the re reciprocal curiosity about the different communities uh, because uh, uh, it's always when Corrado was attending some event, uh, people was curious about the data and the needs he had. And uh, on the same time, when I was attending neuroscience event, uh, people were curious about what kind of magic visualization scientists can do with the data. Uh, just uh, before starting about the specific uh, topics, uh, I wanted to mention a little bit about uh, my current institution, it is a relatively young university that was founded in 2010. It is a member of Qatar Foundation. I am part of the College of Science and Engineering that is even younger because it was founded in 2015 and is mostly focused on graduate programs and on national thematic research areas like cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, smart sensors, and IoT and precision medicine. The university is quite young, but it's very dynamic. It's growing very fast. I want to mention that uh, in this moment we are currently hiring, and especially I'm looking for postdocs. See? So if someone, if someone is interested in joining and having an experience in Middle East in the vibrant city of Doha, is uh, more than welcome to uh, apply. Uh, for uh, starting this talk, uh, I will uh, try to recover uh, the concepts that probably Joanna introduced yesterday, but I will repeat 
even if uh, fast and uh, try to make it clear what it would be the role of visualization for any domain science, but especially for neuroscience. And uh, the mission, uh, it can be expressed uh, very easily uh, in, uh, by saying that uh, our main goal is to try to map data in pictures and colors that give better understanding of data. I mean, it's, uh, I want to mention a really nice uh, a sentence, a Latin sentence that was uh, produced by Edward Glorler, who is the director of uh, Technical University of Vienna Department of Visualization. This is a Latin sentence uh, 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 expressing the mission of visualization people. It's a try to make visible something that apparently is not visible. And uh, for doing that, what we normally do is we try to get uh, visually aesthetic uh, pleasant abstractions of data such that people can get different insights. Uh, the problem is that uh, since uh, how our uh, formament is, is to try to look for abstractions, sometimes we become too abstract and uh, sometimes uh, we lose the connection to reality. And that's why collaboration with domain scientists is very important to uh, try to understand if what we did we do is correctly make sense or not. So here I it's like just want to mention uh, it's like a, a little comparison uh, between uh, visualization and uh, the artistic uh, styles that you could find along the art history. And uh, it's like uh, starting from the uh, the period, the Baroque period, that we can probably compare to the traditional style of examining EM images until getting to more complicated abstractions that can be compared to modern abstract art. You know, you can see the, the painting from Jackson Pollock, Blue Poles, that is compared to abstracto site that was uh, described very amazingly yesterday by Joanna. And in general, what to, I feel and uh, probably what we need to investigate more is to try to understand how to integrate better between domain scientists and visualization scientists in order to make them able to understand the visual abstractions that we provide them. And on the same time, we need to make an effort in a way to understand better the domain science that we are addressing and especially the data they are providing us. In any case, for the project that, uh, for the CRG projects that, that in which I worked in the last five, six years, the uh, pipeline was related to understanding and, and, and processing data coming from a Syrian section electron microscopy. Corrado mentioned about that uh, longly in, uh, in, last, uh, in uh, the previous talk. In general, this kind of technology is the one that is currently used also for connectomics because it's the one providing the highest resolution that is, uh, that is able to provide uh, users uh, the chance to recover and to discriminate the neural structures at organelle levels and very small levels, even glycogen granules and so on. As you can imagine, uh, high resolution images uh, involve the creation of uh, high quantities of image data and our kind of data. So most of the technical challenges are related to scalability issues that uh, can present themselves, uh, especially when you are trying to store data, but also when you try to process it, to filter it, and you try to extract information. And of course, when you try to explore the data in uh, real time. And uh, so from this point of view, the high availi availi availability of uh, data is uh, uh, rapidly changing uh, the paradigm for performing investigations. And it's like here I put a comparison between uh, arcade games and uh, modern games. And this is probably something similar is happening also for uh, for the uh, investigations also in neuroscience that because they are passing from traditional ways in which people uh, examine all the data available and very slowly in a, in a way to understand all features that they can find in the data 
to more data intensive investigations in which people do not have time to explore all the data. They need to trust some systems that provide some automatic knowledge about the data that is on the background in order to get the insight. So uh, one of the most important, uh, probably one of the focus of uh, the group in the Visual Computing Sensor that lead, uh, led by Marcus Adiger uh, was to, to try to make uh, the exploration, the real-time exploration of electron microscopy volumes as more interactive and as more effective as possible. So we passed um, almost three, four years in the, in the last decade to try to develop key enabling technologies for real-time visual exploration of massive electron microscopy stacks. And uh, here I, I can show you some videos. Motivation for development. Some videos uh, uh, of uh, some uh, methods that we published uh, in uh, IEEE TVCG uh, starting from 2018. The first one that was able to uh, provide the user the chance to real time explore sparse segmentation over huge electron microscopy stacks. I won't uh, go too much into the technical details of, of any of the system. And uh, after, uh, after that, uh, we also tried to address the problem of uh, dealing with the KSM dealing with uh, dense segmentations so with uh, volumes containing uh, many objects uh, in quantity that was range was ranging up to millions of objects in the same case uh, the problem that we were addressing is to try to find adequate data structures for uh, managing the presence of objects in, in a specific parts of the volume so by performing queries that could be in real time and related to the position in space of the volume. And, uh, and finally, this is a recent work that I did in, uh, that we did in uh, Qatar. And uh, the mixture graph allows for creating multi- the recent work that we did uh, here in Qatar is a completely different data structure, able to manage uh, volumes, segmented volumes, uh, by, uh, by factoring the, the hierarchy of data in a way that is possible to associate different attributes uh, to the various objects present in the volume and uh, to associate different coloring strategies in uh, according to the various attributes. And this uh, can be done completely in real time. The same structure allows us uh, the chance, allows us to perform, uh, perform uh, statistics of the presence of different objects and different attributes in region of interest in the volume in real time for moderate for moderately uh, sized uh, regions of interest in any case uh, i mean uh, the main uh, mes message that i can give uh, from uh, this part of the talk is that uh, the technologies uh, are getting ready mature for large scale analysis that com can comprise uh, big brain portions uh, potentially we are able to explore petascale volume stacks and even concurrently with uh, the imaging process. And also with the, the technologies developed with hybrid country, uh, culling, we can manage uh, huge numbers of objects present in a volume and potentially we can manage all neurons present in a rodent brain. So that, uh, that concludes the part related uh, to uh, the key enabling technologies for performing uh, high resolution in investigations and uh, high resolution exploration of uh, electron microscopy stacks. What we did uh, after is uh, to integrate various kind of data, various kind of data, various data sources in a way to provide the tools that they could be used by neuroscientists for uh, exploring uh, the data. So we started from the original image stacks we integrated with the label image. Also, we 
compute the connective information, so the information related to the connection between the various uh, objects present in a neural stack, and also we try to integrate some signals and attributes on that. Uh, a part of uh, data integration, we also work there on providing some interaction paradigms that would be uh, novel and useful. Yesterday, Joanna uh, described the very good uh, the, the query algebra that is present in the Connect Explorer system that is uh, uh, relying on, upon uh, representation of the connections through abstract graphs. And uh, it's able to provide uh, domain scientists uh, uh, tools for performing filtering operations based on a region of interest or based on the connections between the various objects, based, in, based on different attributes. And this can be done uh, during real-time 3D exploration. So while users can manipulate the volume, uh, can change the, the viewing parameters and so on. Uh, on top of that, uh, we developed two kinds of visual abstractions. Uh, one is called abstracto site. Uh, Joanna yesterday uh, described uh, that. Uh, Navigating the abstracto space works. Described that uh, uh, amazingly, and uh, it is based on trying to compare the morphology characteristics of uh, neurites and uh, astrocytes, and uh, by changing the different kind of representation. And uh, it start, uh, it's uh, obtained by performing uh, uh, processing of data and by converting them to surface and skeletons. On the other side, we published last year uh, an, an, another tool that they, we call the Glam Vault that was used by Fernanda, uh, the student of Corrado for performing analysis of glycogen. And the, in this tool, we instead uh, used the, and we instead, the system uh, is able to provide real time inspection of customized uh, the Connectome Explorer for performing analysis of uh, uh, absorption patterns of energy that more supposedly can be generated by glycogen on top of some widgets for following the connections between dendrites and uh, axons in a way that user can uh, try to highlight uh, if there are some. Uh, uh, potentially absorption peaks uh, in the different spines in the different uh, neural structures. And this is also can be done in, uh, in uh, real time and was used for performing, uh, for performing investigation or over uh, six, uh, six uh, mice uh, uh, samples uh, for studying uh, the effects of uh, aging over the glycogen uh, uh, over the glycogen distributions. So, uh, furthermore, we we discovered and, and uh, we appreciate the fact that the cost uh, was the pioneering uh, uh, institution trying uh, to use uh, uh, immersive environments for neuroscience investigations. And uh, we realized that, that uh, domain scientists love uh, stereopsis and massive displays because it can provide them a great help for data editing and collaborative analysis. And uh, we, Corrado mentioned that about uh, uh, these two projects, one for performing analysis of glycogen distributions and the other one for uh, performing uh, proofreading and uh, analysis of uh, skeleton representations. They were, uh, last one was published just last year. And in any case, this is still an ongoing activity and uh, was mainly done uh, by Dania Borges. So I will thank her for, uh, for her uh, amazing uh, job about this, uh, about this uh, topic. And uh, as you can see, these tools, they can provide uh, also uh, part of a really amazing uh, experience for uh, for scientists. They provide the way to compare the slides uh, together with uh, the presence of uh, glycogen distributions and also some absorption patterns. On the other case, they provide tools for correcting and for performing uh, the reconstruction of a skeletal representation of neurons and other cells. And uh, 
as uh, I can mention also some work in progress that is related to the project related to Mr. Graph. And uh, currently we are trying to create another uh, kind of visual mapping uh, based on uh, scatter plots of attributes that can be reflected directly to volume of views. And uh, with the, the idea is that in the volumes uh, we can find uh, in many cases in material science, but hopefully also in the neuroscience, we can find uh, a distribution uh, spatial patterns uh, that can be related to some kind of uh, characteristics of uh, distribution of attributes. Our system uh, provides the chance to uh, map uh, different kinds of attributes uh, to uh, different kind of attributes uh, to different colors uh, in the objects. We are planning uh, to use machine learning uh, to try to realize and try to find uh, the, the, can, the attributes that can be mapped correctly to various objects in a way to help uh, users uh, to highlight the spatial patterns that uh, in other cases would be difficult to find. And finally, I will uh, mention a little bit about the other uh, trend and the other topic uh, we, which we worked uh, that is uh, related uh, to try to apply data science and AI for performing uh, visual computing uh, uh, stuff. Uh, Corrado already mentioned about the big problem of trying uh, to find the automatic labeling of electron microscopy data. In, in the project, uh, we mostly relied on a semi-automatic uh, uh, pipeline that we published in TS a few years ago. And nowadays, uh, the students in KAUST, uh, uh, led by Dania, they are trying to apply deep learning for uh, uh, trying to recover in an automatic way the various neural structures. On the same time, uh, we played a little bit uh, with another uh, uh, problem that we tried to address uh, is uh, it was uh, related to try to understand if it's possible uh, to classify cells uh, simply by considering and by analyzing the shape uh, of uh, a nuclei. And uh, for doing that, uh, we started for very simple implicit representation that is uh, based on uh, an evolution of super quadrix objects. And uh, then uh, we complicated the, the representation by performing uh, the composition of the shapes in a spherical harmonics that, uh, as you can see here, uh, are able to uh, faithfully represent the shapes of the various objects. And very recently, we discovered that uh, this, there is no actually need for classification to use a, a faithful reconstruction of the shapes, but the signal present in the mean curvature, uh, in the mean curvature of the surface of the objects is enough for our task. This is a, a paper that, that we just submitted that is under evaluation. And uh, with, this, with our experience, what uh, we got as insight is that we can reasonably distinguish between the neurons and glias. And also, according to the data, new data provided by Corrado, we are, uh, there is, uh, uh, we are, um, we suspect that it is possible even uh, to distinguish and, uh, between the neurons uh, that are uh, extracted from different layers. That stuff needs to be configured because of the limit, uh, the availability of data. In this kind of uh, pipeline. I think we lost Marco. Um, all right, well, maybe, it, Mark, I'm sorry, I think we'll probably move on to the next speaker then, Marwan Abdella. So, um, um, so Marwan did his uh, master's in biomedical engineering at Cairo University. Um, he then came to the Blue Brain Project in 2011, where he first started working as a visualization engineer. Uh, later on, though, he did his PhD in neuroscience, uh, also at the Blue Brain. And his scientific uh, interests include uh, plausibly uh, realistic rendering, um, high performance computing, and of course, uh, in silico visualization. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dan for the introduction. So um, in, in my presentation, I will just like uh, summarize the journey that uh, we have started almost um, four or five years ago towards developing Ultralizer, our framework that we have used to reconstruct and build high fidelity models 
from uh, raw data. So as you know, NGV is, it's all about like neurons, astro, astrocytes and vasculature. And um, as you can see on this image, it's just like um, um, a visualization of the astrocyte uh, connecting a neuron and um, a blood vessel. So I will, I will actually answer a few questions that would let us know more about Ultralyzer. First of all, how do we reconstruct or image these NGV models? So as Corrado uh, and Marco mentioned in the presentation, uh, we have some reconstructions from electron microscope where we end up, for example, having models like um, the image um, we see on the, right, uh, on the right side. Moreover, we also have the optical microscopy reconstructions that we use, uh, for example, Golgi stains or fluorescent stains that um, we, we can then try with the semi-automated or automated methods to reconstruct uh, those traces. And then we can build up model, mesh models like what we can see on the right. So in a summary, the pipeline is simply a volume stack. And then there's a lot of like segmentation work, conver conversion into masks, and then some meshing. So we end up with mesh models. There is also another, um, another path where we can synthesize and build models of um, NGV, for example, the, the, the astroglial models that were uh, provided to us by uh, Elifteris Desis from the Blue Brain, where we have later converted or like made an algorithm that has converted the, the morphologies into uh, realistic meshes, uh, like meshes with realistic geometries. So, the it's like a more important question why do we need these uh, ngv models the first thing is could be like visual analytics and as you have seen yesterday the abastrocyte um, uh, presentation by juana that we need these models in order to get some um, uh, do some analysis and get some visual analytics from from these models that we can use to uh, improve our understanding uh, of certain structural aspects for example Moreover, if you want to get into the function, we need to do reaction diffusion simulation. And that's why we need uh, water type mesh models that can be converted into tetrahedral mesh models where we can perform the simulation. Moreover, we might need them to perform what we, what we call in silico optical experiments. And that was the, the topic of my PhD. For example, here I have uh, synthesized a tissue model and then applied um, a simulation of the light shield process microscope to just like make some, some, some experiment in silico. So the next question is how to generate high fidelity NGV models from existing meshes and masks. So Kaust came, um, Corrado from Kaust came to us with these four fantastic astrocytes that were segmented by his team in Kaust. And then these astrocytes, we wanted to create mesh models from them that we can use for the simulation. But unfortunately, these um, uh, mesh, uh, meshes of the astrocytes were full of uh, non-manifold edges and vertices and even large holes. So thousands of them, as you can see here, in certain cases, tens of thousands of non-manifold edges and vertices, which, mean, which means that we will never be able to synthesize um, tetrahedral meshes out of them. So the question is, how can we fix that? So we tried several mesh-based cleaning solutions, but as you know, the, the meshes that are reconstructed by, for example, from any uh, EM stacks by Elastic or Track EM, they are very, very complicated and they have so many different polygons that we cannot just easily uh, re repair them using geometric solutions. The alternative, so which, which gives us like unrobust method to, 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 to resolve the, 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 the issue. The alternative was to use voxel-based cleaning solution. So I have a stinted part of my PhD thesis and, um, um, uh, and used a parallel implementation, like built a parallel implementation of the dual Martian cube algorithm that would let us actually easily and robustly reconstruct watertight meshes given non-watertight meshes. So as you can see here, we have an input mesh. And from this mesh, I just go through three steps. The one is to reconstruct the surface, um, uh, surface representation of the volume from the mesh, given that if it has like many, uh, uh, many non-manifold edges and vertices or even intersections, and then I reconstruct what's called the solid volume. And from then I can reconstruct um, a mesh again. 
So with that, I was able to build mesh models, volume models, and from them mesh models of large scale data, as you can see from one cell, group of cells, or even tens of cells, or even hundreds of, hundreds of cells that would represent an entire slice. So the pipeline is simply, we have an input mesh, we'll go through surface voxelization, where we can we obtain surface volume, and then solid voxelization, and then we get a solid volume, and then from the remeshing of the, with the dual Martian cube, we can get a mesh. So we actually have a pipeline in Kaust, and then we have taken the mesh from them, and we were able to generate an, an, a, a completely two manifold water type mesh. And then we use the validation, of course, with all the distance to make sure that our method works. So these are the results for one of the astrocytes that were given to us, reconstructed at different resolutions. So you see how thin the, 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 the fibers are given that uh, when we increase the resolution at the end. And then based on Hausdorff distance, we make sure that we haven't done anything wrong and we just get uh, measure the arm, uh, arm is error um, to ensure that our method is completely valid. And these are the reconstructions when we loaded them in, in MeshLab and we have made sure that they are two manifold with zero non-manifold edges and vertices. But you see that the more we increase the resolution, we get um, more appropriate um, models. But the issue is this still because of the DMC algorithm, we still have big Zaggy artifact sort of like we cannot actually um, um, use them in, in the models because they are not that smooth when we create the tetrahedron meshes. So when we like revisiting our pipeline, we had then to add an optimization step. But the point is the mesh that was generated from the DMC algorithm was watertight. The optimized mesh was non-watertight. It, it was too manifold, but it has so many um, self-intersections. So we had to integrate one more stage, which was the geometry processing until we managed to produce the final mesh, which was watertight. And that's an example of how the geometry optimization happens after we um, generate the, the mesh with the dual Martian cube, and then we go on several dissemination factors. So here it's just gonna be obvious that the more we decimate the mesh, we still somehow preserve the geometry and at the end, um, reduce the number of polygons along the surface of the mesh. So what I wanted to show here is that we can choose whatever level of decimation and at the end, of course, we might sacrifice a little bit more polygons. Like here, we measure the number of triangles that we have in the mesh versus the volume error, because we have to make sure that the volume of the mesh is still preserved for, the, for simulation aspects. So we have one a mesh that is decimated level one, another one decimated level 30, but we can figure out from the statistics that the decimation factor of 16 is the most convenient one we can use. We have also implemented a series of um, a geometric quality uh, uh, aspects to measure um, the different geometric aspects of the mesh at each stage. So for example, that these are the quality measures of the input mesh. And these are the measures when we generated the DMC mesh. And the measures tend to be right with the optimized mesh, but this mesh is still no, non-watertight. And after the final, uh, after geometry processing, that's the watertight and optimized mesh, which we can get perfect quality measures. So, there's also one approach where we can reduce the volume resolution. So that's a given mesh by Corrado Cali from Kaos that we have reconstructed meshes out of it with three different resolutions, 128, 256, and 512. And as you can see here, that's a comparison to show the triangulation. It's still clean mesh. The topology is quite nice. But the further you go, of course, the more polygons you have. So at the end, we decided to just take this one part and implement an optimized, uh, an adaptive um, um, remeshing solution that would actually give us the best, um, um, com the best uh, combination of number of polygons and um, fidelity. So, in a summary, here we have three reconstructed astrocyte meshes at three different resolutions, and after thirty iterations of decimation. So, if you just combine them, you're gonna figure out that there was like an optimization factor of almost 1,000 between the mesh with the most oscillated uh, resolution and the, the least oscillated ones. And again, it depends on our usage. What do we need the model for? Do we need it for electro uh, for a reaction diffusion uh, diffusion simulation, or we need it for analytics? So it's all about the the, the 
the uh, the application of the model itself. And so back to our pipeline, that was the pipeline we used to reconstruct mesh from a mesh, but we also decided to scale it and to integrate one more, uh, one further step to reconstruct meshes from volume masks. So instead of just taking the mesh, rather we take the volume masks that were segmented by Kaust, um, our cows collaborators, and then we apply a binarization stage where we generate the binary volume and we use the dual Martian cubes implementation as well. And that's very, very efficient because the entire algorithm, the entire pipeline is implemented uh, using OpenMP. So it's, it depends, of course, on how many cores do you have in your, in your system. So just to show the, the difference, um, we have got the, um, the mesh in red, which is like beneath the one we have reconstructed, reconstru is, is done with track, um, with track M2, and our mesh in blue was reconstructed with ultralizer. And that's an X-ray projection from the mask. So if we just like make a close-up here on part of the EM and then further close-up, and then we make a comparison, we see how the mesh that was reconstructed with ultra with ultralizer has captured all the geometry that was in the mask itself. And the one that was given with track EM, it has more, I'd say, um, uh, um, it's like less less volume scanned, and that's why it wasn't perfectly matching the mask. So what? How else we can generate the NGV models, given that we have morphology skeletons, not meshes or masks? Because in certain cases, like the uh, vasculature, we have got from Bruno Weber um, uh, a series of morphologies for volume vasculature, for, for vasculature, where we had then used um, some of our tools to just like do the analysis using uh, this morphovas. And from then we have actually integrated into Ultralizer as well, a model that takes whatever uh, morphologies and produce high fidelity meshes that are also optimized and um, have um, um, and um, water type to be used for whatever simulations for the dot flow analysis. Moreover, we have worked in collaboration with Eleftherius, who used the vasculature model to be able to sensitize those astrocyte uh, morphologies that we built an algorithm in, in, in Blender and generated um, the mesh that is in A. That's like a pure mesh that was done with, uh, with metabols, but then we used Ultralizer actually to uh, apply the optimization uh, step where we have managed to end up with a clean topology optimized and watertight mesh. And again, the optimization level depends on the objective. In image number one, we have the huge, the, 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 the entire um, vasculature mesh, but we would like to visualize pretty much as, as many, or like as many as we can of the astrocytes. That's why we don't have to have um, uh, high fidelity meshes per se, but more like very, very, very optimized to be able to just load um, different um, and, uh, huge amounts of them. And in the one in the middle, image number two, we can we would like to verify how the end feet are wrapped around the vasculature. So we need uh, more optimized uh, meshes, of course. And on the right side, we have the uh, reaction diffusion simulation. So we have to make sure that these meshes are very, very, very um, I would say capturing all the geometry, they are high fidelity with which we can accurately simulate uh, calcium uh, uh, propagation um, experiments, for example. And with that, I just come to the most important slide. That's the structure of ultralizer. So it takes four different four different kinds of data with a morphology skeletons, non-watertight meshes, volume stacks, or even binary volume masks, where the, the volume masks are all um, binary, but the stacks we just use an ISO value to decide on which level that we're going to do the segmentation. And we produced watertight and optimized meshes with mes mesh metrics and also large scale volumes where we can use um, um, them for our in silico optical experiments. And within Ultralizer itself, there are like six modules the surface voxelization, solid voxelization, dual Martian cubes the mesh optimization and repair based on uh, open source solutions. So we have integrated them into our framework. And finally, the mesh and volume analysis and with which, with which four of them are completely paralyzed using OpenMP. With that, I would like to actually mention all the papers that 
were funded by the grant and acknowledge all the collaborators we have worked with during this uh, amazing journey and funding indeed. So thank you very much if you have any questions. Great, thank you Marwan. I think there was a question that came via chat. Um, I'll read the question. It says, some meshes you showed appear disconnected. Is this intentional or a result of mesh decimation? Um, some of the meshes I have shown with disconnected, that's because of the meshes, the morphologies themselves. For example, the, the vasculature, we have for one data set, you have many, many polylines in the same data set. So in this case, they are, con they are disconnected, of course, because the graph is not completely connected. And for the astrocyte meshes, that depends on the segmentation. So for the same mesh, you might have one mesh, one mesh, but multiple mesh objects because of the segmentation. So it's actually a given thing. Okay, makes sense. Um, I think we'll open up the floor to questions for, um, for all presenters today. Any um, additional questions? There's a uh, poetry with a question now. Yeah, hello, so I'm Audrey. I'm a postdoc in Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Japan. Um, very nice talk and work. Thank you very much for sharing. I was wondering if um, the meshes that you presented are gonna be um, shared with uh, the whole community. Because um, I'm doing reaction diffusion simulations and I would be interested in, um, in those meshes if they are. Currently we are in the process of open sourcing Ultralyzer. So probably in a, less than a month, it's gonna be available on BlueBrain GitHub. So you can just download nice. it and com compile it. For the meshes per se, that depends on, on the agreement and depends on the... Uh, yeah, I think I, I might just jump in here. They will be available via this uh, web portal that we um, um, are making available. But I think we, we'd be able to share them uh, perhaps sooner if you just write us. Great. Great, perfect. Well, um, I'll get in contact with you guys then. Thank you. Any additional questions? Uh, I, I might have a question maybe for Marwan and, and Corrado. Uh, so um, I, I'm not in, very much into the modeling, but uh, the biological question would be, which is the surface uh, of an astrocyte? So uh, if if the surface uh, is sensitive to the resolution of the meshing. So how do you know you're getting the right numbers? Uh, do you have in, 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 the, in, the, in the model some thermodynamics of uh, membrane curvature that would give you a boundary condition? Because I mean, Corrado was mentioning that one of his finding was that this uh, very high surface to volume ratio of an astrocyte, which is very interesting. But maybe according to your, uh, the latest data we saw, maybe the surface is 10 times larger than Corrado's found. Is, um, is it a, a reasonable question? That's a very valid question that I have also noted in my notes when Corrado presented. So ba bottom line, like baseline, you can easily from the stack measure the volume. Okay, so you have the number of voxels and then you have the voxel dimension. So you can measure, you can measure the, 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 the volume of, 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 each, um, of each data set you have, for example, for an astrocyte. The fact that you measure the surface area, you have to have a watertight mesh to be able to, to measure the actual surface area of the mesh. But that depends also on the way you do the optimization. For example, if you use the dual Martian cubes, which gonna like align the mesh exactly on a, on a rectangular grid, you will get some numbers, but they are not correct per se because you, you don't have the actual smooth curves. So that depends on how, how the neurobiologist, for example, would say, okay, I would consider this exactly part is, the, is more convenient than just doing the optimization because once you do one level of optimization, you reduce the surface area. But of course it won't jump to like 10 times. It might be just a fraction, like maybe 5%, 10% or less, but it won't be 10, 10, 10 times the, uh, the surface area. 
That's why we have added in Ultralizer actually the, the metrics for the mesh and the volume at the end to be able to compare whether our, because we can measure the volume of the, uh, the, 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 the volume grid and the volume from a surface mesh, but it has to be water tire. So we do the, before the optimization from the BMC, we get the volume. After the optimization, we get the volume. And then we measure the, the, the difference in volume. And then whether we, we, we see whether that's a, a significant amount or that's like something that we can just say, okay, it's trivial because it's less than 2% or something. And that's why I have shown the graph with the number of polygons versus the, the dissonation or smoothing factors to make sure that we don't take it to another level where the, 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 the surface area and volumes are completely different. Uh, Corrado, do you have any, uh, any take on that? No, I mean, I, I think you said it all. Uh, most of the problem of uh, uh, measuring the, the, the surface area is a numeric solution, is a numeric problem, sorry. So, um, and in particular, I mean, this, uh, this was a, something we have been working a lot together uh, with Marwan because at the very beginning, um, we, we, I, I, I used to deal with easier mesh, let's say, uh, because when I was uh, when I was working with Graham, we were uh, more measuring uh, axons and dendrites, uh, and this the the, the the structure and its and portions uh, portions of these and the structure are easier, are smoother. So we we had less of um, uh, we had less of these mesh problems that Marwan had spotted. But in these largest models, which are um, in a way, multi-resolution because we, you, you, you have some very gross morphologies like the soma, but you have also these very fine, small uh, lameliform processes, which requires a much higher resolution. Then this, the, the, this fragmented structure created these uh, mesh problems that when you do a measurement, uh, create some, um, some uncertainty and some fluctuations. Uh, and so because of this, you can have these uh, these problems in the measures. But as Marwan says, we, uh, in the end, uh, we measured some differences that are in the order of, uh, of, five, of a few percent to a five percent. So I think that wouldn't influence that much the, the surface area to, to volume ratio uh, that uh, I have been measuring. What could change that could be the subcompartment that you're, uh, that you're looking at. Because if you look at the, at the neuropil, uh, like in the small blocks that I have showed at a certain point, and you move the surface area to volume ratio there, uh, you you arrive uh, at numbers in the order of 12 or 14, which is much higher, rather than looking at the whole cell where uh, you average um, a bigger volume. So we, we have numbers between three and five or something like that, if I remember correctly. Great. I think we'll need to close the first session here.